Welcome back to A Lifetime of Mafia Tales. Today, Sal and I discuss Lucchese crime family capo Anthony Gaspipe Castle. Anthony worked his way up to the top of the Lucchese crime family. He did some very sick things to get there. In the end, it didn't work out for him too well. Anthony Castle had a book named Confessions of a Mafia Boss made about his life as a mobster. This is where we're basing our information off today. You decide whether it's true or not. There is so much more information about him, so this is just part one. We're going to be doing a part two next week. Please be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more videos like this. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our Patreon channel for more exclusive stories about Anthony Gaspipe Castle. And without further ado, sit back and enjoy today's episode. Good morning, Sal. How you doing, man? Good, man. This is... uh. A new, uh, a new time. We're going to start covering a lot of criminals that became very infamous. And like this guy, Casso, I mean, it's my opinion before we even start. This is an example of how the public used to think there was something romantic about a guy like Casso, who was a mob guy. And he lived this, you know, unbelievable life when in fact... He was a very sick, demented, psychotic killer. Yeah, and there's a lot of information to back that up. I mean, even in his personal book, which me and you have gotten information from, you know, we're going to talk about it. And, you know, with his uh, information that he rec reconciled, whatever it may have been, you know, what he thought about, he wanted to write a book for whatever reason, you know, an author approached him and, he gave, it's called uh, Confessions of a Mafia Boss, which is a pretty good read, I would say. I mean, I read the whole book. It was really long, and there's yeah. a lot of good information in there, which whether it's true or not, I mean, we don't know. This, this is just right. his uh, recollection, re recollection, you know what I mean? So yeah. we'll, uh, you know, me and you will kind of dissect it, and, you know, the people listening, you can call whether it's BS or not. Right. But, uh, you know, we just want to put that and make it clear up front. This is, you know, where we got a lot of the information from. Okay. So, uh, you know, Sal, I think the best, we, you know, this is just part one. We're going to do a part two for, you know, the next week. And so in this episode in particular, you know, we want to cover, uh, cover his early life and just getting involved with the mafia and what, uh, what drew him to be so easy to be involved with committing murders and just really understand what was going through his head as a young kid. So, right. <clears throat> You know, I mean, if you want, I can go a little bit into his early life, his background with his family and okay. everything like that. So <clears throat> when you do that, because the guy was born in 42, so yep, he's only right. like three years older than me. Okay. So he lived in the late 50s and 60s. And as you, you know, unveil all the details that that we've done the research on, I can tell you what it was like in those days, you know, because how secretive everything was. And the secrecy issue and element of being that life is what drew you in because you were living a life that other people knew about and you were inside the life of the mob and what that does to a person. So as you start to revo reveal all his early, uh, his early activities, uh, I'll comment on some of that. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's a good way to... Uh... Right. To do that, because you always talk about how secretive it was back then. And right. I, I suppose you guys are around the same age, which is I didn't even really <laughs> take that into consideration. So, I mean, you could have, you know, ran into him on the street, but you never did. But, uh, you, you know, what I'll say is, you know, he was born in 1942. Uh, he had his mother. He had his father in his life and they were legit people. And he also had an uncle who, well, I guess it was his godfather named uh Sally Calambrano, who was a capo in the Genovese family. He was the one that influenced Anthony into the mob. You know, he, Anthony wasn't with the Genovese family. He went on to be with the Lucchese's. But seeing that as a young kid, I'm sure that had some kind of impact on him. Seeing how his uh, godfather was running the streets and probably had nice cars and making money and all kinds of different benefits from being in the right, mob. Right. To, to whereas his parents, they were just legit people. So... Right. Uh, you know, his father's nickname was actually gas pipe as well. He didn't get it because he was hurting. I, I, you know, he wasn't killing people with it. You know, yeah, I think he was just getting in fights with it and he would carry it just around to, you know, any kind of intimidation tactic on stuff. But 
Castle would eventually adapt that nickname for, you know, beating people pretty badly as well with it. Um, <clears throat> and then he witnessed his first murder in 1954. Uh, he was on the corner, and I, I believe it was the murder of Donald Mariano, who was shot to death on Fifth Ave. So whatever that might have been, he was able to see this, you know, I guess if he was born in 1942, he would have seen this in 1954. So 12, 12, 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine that influence. Yeah, they, they made a big uh, display of that in the, in the movie Bronx Tale. When the I kid, recall. yeah, when the kid saw, you know, someone beaten or murdered. And then that sort of sucked that character in the movie in. And then they, they when I say they, the mob guys, congratulated that young kid for not talking about it, as they did in Goodfellas after Henry Hill got busted. They made a point. Scorsese made a point of when Henry got bailed out on an arrest. Oh, they celebrated him. Oh, you're a good guy. You know, you didn't rat on your friends, this, that, and the other. And so they were building this here image up of, of the mob, like a brotherhood. That's and I'm true. sure that happened to Castro. Well, yeah. I mean, the way you talk about it is just like the way that I believe it was probably with him. I mean, he didn't say nothing. He wasn't going right. to the cops or anything right. like that. There right. was right. nothing like that. So it was just him getting deeper involved with it. And they're like, mm -hmm. okay, this kid could be possible, you right. know, be, be a p potential criminal. Because if he's just does, if he handles this okay, then well, we can start, you know, grooming him, you know, add that to his resume or whatever they want to call it. But right, you know, his first uh, arrest was he was in a, involved with a gang. I'm not sure what kind of what gang it was, but he was getting in, into fights with Irish people, you know, some Irish gang, and they didn't get along at all. So I mean, are you able to expand on Irish and? Oh, Italian yeah. guys not getting along. What, what yeah, was the whole beef with that? By the time you're 10 or 15 years old, you understand the distinction about the Italian culture and the rest of the ethnic people in New York, whether they were black, Hispanic, Irish, Polish, okay? And in the 50s and the 60s, we had those groups. Of course, we, uh, you know, later on, the Russians started coming in and they were criminals. So what you thought yourself of was above all the other ethnic groups in New York City. You looked down on the Irish or the blacks or the Puerto Ricans, okay, and felt superior because the mob guys made you feel that way. It was an image that made men, mob guys, were selling. And that's what Gotti signed on to maybe when he was like, say, oh, Gotti was born in 1940, so by the time he was, let's say, 15 years old in the mid-50s, he had met mob guys like Charlie Fatico and Danny Fatico, the two brothers, and, and watched those guys the way they acted. So you started to realize that you were going to try to become one of those guys, a made man, made man who had fancy clothes, a fancy car. People were afraid of made men, so they got as they said in the Bronx tale, they got fear and they got respect. So that was sort of a balancing act about what made guys uh, allowed other young up and coming mob guys to look at. We're going to get fear and we're going to get respect. And we, I think we heard Anthony Reggiano talking about how his father took him into certain meetings and groups and bars and, and they respected Fat Andy because he was a known made man. And then you start to think that, okay, I'm going to go up. That's what I'm going to become. Well, I mean, that's, that's what they see when they're growing up. And right. like right. his his family wasn't, like I said, involved with it. But his father would eventually give up and say, you know what? I'm just going to accept the fact that my son was isn't going to be anything else right. in life. So right. I'm sure the father and mother didn't want to know that Anthony – gas pipe castle was going to be killing people uh at such a rate that nobody knows how many people he killed but this is something the guy obviously enjoyed doing killing so that's and, a sick demented part of a personality well eventually you know the mob did 
come to him. You know, Chrissy Tick was a man that was in the Lucchese family, and he took a liking to Anthony. And so Anthony started um, after after hour clubs, and, you know, he would work and kick up money to Chrissy Tick. And he also met Paul Castellano, and they were cool with each other at one time when he was coming up. So, I mean, their relationship would change over time, I'm sure. And, you know, Anthony Castle, this was – the first time as well when he had shot someone, he, he killed uh, – He what he said the situation was is that uh, he there was a junkie on the street giving a woman a hard time, and he shot the man to death. Right. Um, the name of the man was, uh, I believe, Bebop. And Bebop was, had an uncle who was Carmine – let me think uh, – Bovi, who uh, was a capo in the Genovese family. And um, <clears throat> so this caused the whole whole issue, you know what I mean? But this made, uh, you know, everything went, went and got resolved. And, you know, the mafia guys were more interested in Anthony after he took care of this murderer. I mean, right. it wasn't like it was something for the mob. It was just yeah. he said the guy was giving a woman a hard time. So that's what he had justified yeah. it and said that's why he did it. Well, you know, they start to feel that they're infallible. That, you know, they can do anything, get away with anything, because don't forget, every mob guy always wanted to have corrupt cops on the payroll, giving them money so they could get information. I don't know what particular murder that Castle did, but I remember reading about that. He murdered someone and he went back and told the guy that, uh, you know, wanted him to commit this murder. Oh, I don't want anything from you. I'll just. You owe me a favor. Yeah. That's what he said. A favor. You did you did a murder, and you told the guy who asked you to do that mur murder, I don't want anything for it. I don't want anything, any money. I don't want any prestige. You owe me a favor, and one day you'll call in that favor. So Whatever, this is maybe. the way the mob worked back then. Now, we're talking about, let's say, in 1962, Castle was only 20 years old, so he was learning the ropes. And like I said, during the 50s and 60s, all mob activity was ultra, ultra secretive. And unless you live back there, and that's why I'm here to explain what it was like in and around that life, you wouldn't understand how secretive it was. Well, with the secrets came the fear from the general public. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's how they worked. That's how the mob worked, purveying yeah. fear. And and I will add on to that uh that shooting that I had talked about just a couple minutes ago, I guess, you know, I've read further down as well in my notes. It was that the guy didn't die. He was, this caused a whole sit down, you know, with Bebop and his uncle and Anthony Castle had his godfather go there to represent him. And then even his father went to the sit down. And what was resolved was that Anthony Castle would turn himself in and Bebop would not testify on him in court. And so the charges were dropped. So right. that, let me, uh, I guess I, I didn't get that out there all the way, but right. so we'll eventually get into him, you know, committing murders and stuff. But another one was uh, before Vincent the Chin was the boss of the family, of the Genovese family, he offered Anthony Castle to come into the family. And Anthony said he wasn't sure about that. So, I mean, that's uh, they must have had a good relationship in some kind of way because, you know, because he, he he worked his way up into the Lucchese family. But it seemed like the Gambinos and the, you know, Genovese guys, they, they also took a real liking to him. So either way, he could have been in seems like either, either crew, really. Well, the thing is that you got to remember, once he got close to that, that uh, Christy Ticker, Tick, I think his name was. Yeah, Bernard. Christy Tick. Fanari or something. Uh, he wasn't going to let him go over to another family because he was already earning money and kicking money up to this guy, Christy Tick. So, you know, I think there was a mention of uh, him meeting with the chin or someone and said, oh, you could have you could have been with our family, but it's OK. You're with these other guys. And that's when the, the mob upper echelon respected each other. You know, you were sort of what they called on record. Once you're on record, you belong to that that family, that crew. Who you were talking about is Anthony said it was uh, Carlo Gambino who he had ran into. Okay. And so he's like, hey, I heard about you on the street. 
too bad you're with the Lucchese's, but right. you know, you're doing a good right. job is what yeah. Anthony recalled him saying. That, yeah, the made the made guys share information with other made guys, and they usually have a, a line they use. Yeah, that guy, he did some work, which meant he killed somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. And they share that information secretly. <clears throat> And then they have a respect and they have a fear because as you get down the road, if you start reading about how Castle was treated and there was a reason, you know, that eventually other mob guys wanted to kill him because he was treacherous and he was convincing and he was probably extorting other mob guys or extorting businesses. Nobody knows all the stuff that you do on a daily basis. No, there's you know, when we do these podcasts and then people hear all these stories that I convey, which are 99 and 44, 100, it's true. They go, <laughs> oh, there's no way that guy, Sal, could have did all of that stuff. But they have to understand, you were a criminal 24 hours a day. You were getting into all types of crime every day, every week, every month. That's what you did. Well, you know, to talk more about his early work for the mob, Anthony, well, you know, in his early years, he was uh, doing a lot of hijackings. That was his thing. And it seemed to be a lot of the mob guys things, even yours and yeah. the guys that you did it with. So, I mean, that's he did things, no questions asked. And right. that's and he had no no reason to do that or no interest except furthering the mobs criminal enterprise, I guess. Right. Not, and, I don't know. And not asking for anything or expecting anything from that Gambino guy that, well, you know, there was a killing, he had favor from them. Like, you know, okay, this is a good guy. He didn't do it for money. He didn't do it for uh, prestige. He didn't do it to elevate himself. So, but it's okay. You know, now we have something that connects us. And because the murder crime usually connected people and what it created was between the mob guys sort of... Um, a guarantee that if you were associated with somebody and you committed a murder together, you were sort of locked together in a crime and you wouldn't talk about it. You weren't going to reveal that you did it. There was a time when no one ever talked about murders that they committed together because that would be an easy way to get convicted because in New York, New York state, you needed what they called a cooperation. If I came along and I said, Oh, that guy, um, Adrian, he, he murdered somebody. That's not enough to get convicted in the state of New York. You needed someone else to say, yes, I saw that guy murder someone and uh, Sal's telling the truth. So in New York State, that's what you needed. But what the general public didn't know was that the FBI, the federal government, they didn't have murder charges that often until they created the RICO statute. And then in the federal courts, guess what? You didn't need two people. You didn't need to collaborate another person's testimony about a murder. You could go to court and have one witness say, I saw that guy murder that other man, or he told me he murdered him, and you can get convicted. So that's some of the things that were changing along the way was the laws, the social acceptance of the mob. And it took a long time to sort of deglamorize it from a professional legal point of view. Even when I flipped and was dealing with the FBI, one time I was talking to an FBI agent. I said, well, what would you do if you weren't an FBI agent? He said, oh, are you kidding me? I'd be want to be like you, a criminal. <laughs> I go, why would you want to be a criminal? Because you guys don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> you drive the best cars. You got the best clothes. You got fancy women. And you get away with crime most of your life. That's Damn. what the FBI agent told me. Of course, that was, you know, 40 years ago. And of course, everything did change. But even the FBI themselves looked at mob guys as like, wow, what a special, cool life. Not. No. It wasn't cool, okay? <laughs> no, not at all, man. Especially yeah. now that the laws have changed. There's hard, hardly any way to ever get away with it. Right. But there was a moment in time when Anthony said that his life had changed that after his father had died from a heart attack and he was, he just said he was never the same. And this is when he just became evil and didn't, didn't right. care about anything anymore. His heart just turned yeah. cold was just yeah. the death of a father, man. And that's, yeah. I don't know. That was enough to make him have that switch yeah. to where it's like, whatever, I'm going to, 
do whatever now. It doesn't matter, I guess, for whatever reason, man. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand there is a certain point in anybody's life who's a criminal where you examine yourself. And there was a time when, you know, I lived by, I was on a line. There was things I wouldn't do. I wouldn't go across the line. And internally, I always thought, I, you know, I have no business participating in a murder. We don't have the right to kill someone. So luckily for me, that was always my line. And I came close to getting involved, you know, with a murder with Cataldo digging a grave, but it didn't happen. And I didn't feel bad. Eventually, that guy got murdered. That was uh, the one I was supposed to go dig a grave for. But looking back, I believe guys like Casso and Gotti, they broke the line. They went across the line and did things they knew was wrong, even inside the life. I mean, look at Gotti. He went and killed the head of the family, really, without any permission. <laughs> Yeah. What he did. Well, you, uh, to add into what you're saying is that when he, Anthony, he were called making his bones, he had killed a man for the Lucchese family. So they told him to do it. And again, he had no questions. He went and took this man out to a bar. And, at, you know, later he shot him in the back of the head and got rid of the body. Just did, like that, cold. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it was like going to the grocery store, getting milk and eggs. You know, it was just something he had to do, and uh, he was going to think about it after he did it. Well, that's, I don't know what year that was, but that's the way that life was. Like I told you, Cataldo, you know, he met a guy that uh, Joey Cataldo, his brother loaned money to. The guy wouldn't pay the money. He waited a couple of weeks, had a walk with him, walked him down a couple of blocks where it was dark and, you know, sort of uh, isolated and shot him in the head and left him there. Cold. That was it. It's, uh, I don't know, to be able to do that, it's just something's something's off, you know what I mean? It's like a switch is on, you know, like turned off to where you can just be that cold. And that Cold, cold and callous, because, yeah. Because there's yeah. no coming back from yeah. death. Go man. back there's to nothing. the bar, have a few drinks and laugh, and uh, it was just like another day at the office. This is the way these, you know, sick, demented murderers conducted their life. Yeah. And then they shared very little of that with other guys. I mean, they really did pick and choose who they shared that secret with of killing because, you know, there's not, not a statute of limitations on murder. But this Castle guy, he was violent through and through. I mean, well, and, and if you look at some of the lines that were mentioned in that book, he didn't want to be the head of a family. He didn't want hmm. the responsibility. I, I have a feeling in... That in my judgment, he figured if he became the head of the family, that was an easy way to get killed. That's true, and probably to be pursued the highest by the feds too, right. and a whole lot of uh, other right. headaches. But yeah, yeah, he, he ended up recommending Vic Amuso, and so Vic became the boss, and obviously Anthony was his right hand man in that life. Right, but he uh, he just told him, no, I don't want to be responsible what he right. said i don't want to be responsible for all these other guys and what they have involved yeah. what what they're doing and anytime they screw up i don't want to be held accountable so yeah. he just said no i'm, I'm good but i mean there was probably he, he a was another there. example of a criminal who didn't have any reservations about what type of crime he was going to participate in because if you read about it he participated in hijackings drugs murders and he also participated in paying off law enforcement everybody always wanted to have somebody a cop or an fbi agent that they could pay off to get information so when you read his story you understand that he knew the power of the of law enforcement of how how he got involved with the two mafia cops i don't really know how he got involved with them but he made them do things was amazing because they actually thought they were infallible they were above the law because you know they were taking money from castle and then he actually had them killing people and what i'll say is with the mafia cops there's a whole lot of information about them out there and what we'll do is i got some notes we'll go on patreon and we'll right. uh after this episode, and we'll talk about the mafia cops. So we'll hold yeah. that story for our Patreon subscribers. But I was also going to bring up the 
you know, his, he had close ties with the Gambino family. He, uh, you know, certain guys he was close with like Roy DeMeo, they, he would sell them guns to Anthony. Right. And then Frank DeChico and Anthony, according to Anthony, again, like I said, uh, they shot a man in broad daylight. The reason they killed him was because he robbed an associate of theirs and he felt, he felt nothing about this. He just said it was street justice and they moved on. So, right. I mean, you, you met Frank Chico as well, I believe. In yeah, prison. I was in jail with Chico. He was a gentleman, and he was, you know, known as a tough guy. And I think that it was important that Gotti enlisted him and his support, you know, when he decided to take out Castellano. So I don't know exactly what Castle's relationship with was with Chico, but uh, he was in and in and around with all heavyweight mob guys and all those families. And I mm -hmm. mean. He had built up a reputation, uh, gas pipe. And I think the public, you know, could read about him and realize how vicious and violent he was. But this was the guy who would kill somebody and just move on, you know, uh, to the next day of his life. Uh, he did he did contradict himself occasionally because, you know, he said that he had a girlfriend for years. And yet he said he only loved his wife. Well, if you love your wife, you're not going to have a girlfriend. And eventually the wife was devastated I'm by sure. his activities. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. another, um, you know, hit that he had talked about was that Roy DeMeo had took out a man named Bennett, who was an informant against Roy and Anthony's pot business. So apparently they were dealing pot together, too, is what he said. So I don't know, man. They, like you said, they were involved with doing selling drugs and stuff, you know, so... He talked about that. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, there wasn't much detail on the whole situations, of course. But like I said, this is uh, he, he had informants go against him before he became one himself. And like <clears throat> so with that, he would go on to be an informant in prison and stuff later on, which we'll get to. But he experienced it and he had lots of paranoia. And with our part two, we'll cover him taking out or fat Peter attempting to, because at first this guy wasn't an informant, but they went back and forth and, you know, he ended up doing some, you know, shooting this guy a bunch of times, but I don't know, lots of paranoia in that, in that life. Yeah, I, I think the interesting stories about him was how he used revenge and influence to get, you know, get other people, he was a, a con man because he conned those two New York City police officers to finding someone who had who actually shot him. The guy who shot him, what mm -hmm. was his name again? Um, Jim, uh, Jimmy Heidel. 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 Yeah. yeah. And, and and I guess that was an order from another family to kill Castle. I remember researching for when we did the Angelo Ruggiero episode was that. The reason Angelo hated him was because he said Anthony was calling him a, a rat because he was caught on those wiretapes just talking, right. spewing oh, out yeah. information that we've all we've all known about. Yeah. So that was the early eighties that they penetrated um they actually penetrated Angelo's re, uh, residence. Right. And and how that happened, a lot of people didn't pay attention to it, but that happened because he was in the spotlight of, of, you know, his brother, Angelo Ruggiero's brother was a successful drug dealer and a car thief way back. I had known Sally way back in the sixties. And so the FBI started to get information and they had Willie Boy Johnson and they must've had some other information which would allow them to get wiretap authorizations. And once those wiretaps were made, Everybody in and around the mob, all the families knew that Angelo was in a lot of trouble if those wiretaps became public, like going into a, you know, into a trial. So at that point, you know, a guy like Casso, who said he always hated rats, he considered Angelo a rat. He didn't give information, you know, willingly, but the stuff that he talked about on the phone, Angelo was obsessed with sharing stories on the phone with other mob guys and so i guess castle decided he was a rat and then when he called 
Angelo Rat. I guess Angelo decided to have him killed. Yeah, he had set up a hit, and then the the guy shot Castle maybe like six times. Castle lived, and then eventually went to the hospital, got sewn up, and then he ended up getting information from the mafia cops, and the mafia cops were able to find out but to bring this Jimmy Heidel to him. And then he ended up putting him in the trunk of his car. He took him to a location and tortured him and eventually took him out. And it was not just, it was just, it was a brutal one too. The and details just, was, of how he tortured this guy, you know, he, he tortured this Heidel. I don't even know who this Heidel was uh, connected to. Maybe the Gambinos, I'm not sure, but obviously yeah. You know, when Castle got his hands on him, he he tortured him. Uh, I don't know for for hours or something. That's what it was. Yeah, that he just did it for hours and <clears throat> just a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> you know, just just really sick, man. I don't even know if I want to even <laughs> really say it because it's just just a lot, really a lot of brutal stuff. And yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't know, man. It was just sick. All the stuff that he did, and then to, for him to really go into detail about that. It just goes to show that there was just something in his head where he was just like, oh, I just want to, I'm fine with doing this kind of stuff. But he was very angry because that guy shot him six times and almost killed I did, him. I did read a little bit about Philip Carlo. Yeah, and the, the author of the book. He was the author. He went and spent time with Casso mm -hmm. and got all the details when he wrote the book. Well, this guy Carlo, he was born and raised in and around the mob too. And I, I also read that he went and spent like countless days with the Iceman at oh, Sick so. Murderer. So he he was fascinated with murderers. And I guess he it was his ambition to write books about, you know, these sick, demented murderers. And uh, eventually Carlo died. He wound up getting Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease and died a miserable death. But um, yeah, there was a young girl that was working with Philip Carlo. And if you research Carlo's background, you can find that, I guess, she assisted him writing, writing these books. But Carlo spent a lot of time with Casso. Now, again, you have to understand the ego of a criminal. A guy like him, he had this huge ego, Casso. And so he wanted to paint the picture of his life the way he saw the picture of right. his life. Well, that's what we'll, uh, you know, in part two, we'll go into more detail with him getting busted and going to court and lying to the feds right. and what, he, why he ended up getting locked up for so long and why he never got out and even after right. he became an informant. So, right. like I said, with the information provided, I'm sure the author did his best to do research and compare to what Castle was saying, because I'm sure he wasn't just going to take his word for it. And yeah. So I'm sure he so did his best. Yeah. To, in the to second work. part, when we do the second part about Casso, and I think it would be fascinating if we could open up, open up the, uh, open up the story to the listeners because everything he did backfired at the end in his life, and he wound up not creating some type of credibility to become a witness for the government. They do. They actually saw him as unredeemable guy just murdered, you know, murdered and, you know, went about his life and there was no rhyme or reason why, you know, why he was so obsessed with murdering. And what he did say was he hated rats hmm. informants. And that's what he became. He went to the other side, but he wasn't successful at convincing the government that he could tell them the truth. I guess he lied. Remember, it said he took a lie detector test and he failed it. Well, let me tell the listeners that when I went on the other side, my sole purpose was to give them the information about the corrupt judge that I was involved in. And the government made me take a lie detector test. And we did it for hours and hours. And after they had it examined, they said, well, okay, Sal, we can see that everything you said was the truth because that's what the government uses, not so much at a trial for the jury. They use it to give it to the judge so the judge can make a determination on how credible this witness can be at a criminal trial. 
So it showed that I told the truth. Now with Casso, he probably was lying every other minute. Yeah, and see, this that's what I'm saying. Part two, we'll be able to compare your story, your cooperation with his cooperation, and right. why yours was successful and why his wasn't. Right. Because there's a lot to to be said there. And I mean, either way, you know, giving him a deal versus you is that's a whole that's a whole different ballpark, a whole different thing, a game. And just just I mean, you weren't doing what he was doing, obviously, but no, you know, but the 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 purpose of it is to say, okay, well, Sal didn't lie and he, and you know, Anthony was lying. And so that's why he wasn't given a break at all. Yeah, even Sam, in order Sammy testified about 19 murders. Uh, from what I knew, he told the government all the truth. And then they picked him up. They gave him a, you know, probation <laughs> and they sent him off to the program. And I guess he couldn't get away from the idea that he liked crime. Mm -hmm. You have to cut that cord immediately when you leave you know, the life and the government puts you somewhere to start over. You've got to say, okay, that was yesterday. This is today. I'm not going to be involved in crime, but some guys can do it. Some can. Yeah. him, him uh, Anthony Castle did not like the deal that they gave Sammy because he could, he could have got that same deal, but he blew it. You know, Castle blew it because he, I guess they didn't find him credible at all. So right, they were right. in, the, in the book, you know, like I said, in part two, we'll cover more about that too, when he was going and cooperating right. and what his beef was with Sammy. But, um, you know, is there anything else you want to, you know, any messages you want to leave here before we wrap up and go on to Patreon to talk about the mafia cops? I think what, what I would like to say to the listeners is that this is a, an example of how, that particular guy, Casso, started to, in a strange way, de-glamorize the mob himself by the stuff that he did. And at the end, just look at the results of his life. A murderer who died a miserable death. I don't know, he had a couple of diseases. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's the old, maybe the old biblical line, you know? What you sow is what you reap. And he died a miserable death. And we can go into more information on how the government used his, his experiences and his history. And I believe, uh, you know, at that time, I don't know if that was the 80s or the 90s, whenever that was, the government was making huge inroads in convicting all kinds of, uh, you know, mob guys with the Rico statue and everything else. And I believe the public is didn't want to let go of how romantic they thought the mafia was because of films like the Godfather. Oh, it's about family. It's wonderful. You protect each other. Not so. That's not so. And I lived it. So I know that. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's a movie. You can look at movies all the time and think it's fascinating, but it wasn't true. It was a facade. That's what it was. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for watching, and of course, we'll see you on the next one. Anthony Castle has one sick story. With part two of our video, you'll understand why the criminal life doesn't end well at all. This just goes to show that that criminal life is a dead end. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Please be sure to subscribe to our Patreon channel for an exclusive story about Anthony Castle and the Mafia Cops. We're going to go over there after this, after this show ends. Please be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel channel as well if you want to get more videos from me and Sal. Also, I wanted to say if you enjoyed this podcast with me and Sal, you'll enjoy my podcast called the Invest in Yourself podcast. On that podcast, I do the shows myself and I interview all kinds of different ex-mobsters, ex-criminals, gangsters, all kinds of different people that were involved with the criminal life, but decided to change their story around and have a great redemption story. So please check it out. All you have to do is go to this, click this YouTube channel. It's on the same one. Go to the playlist and click the Invest in Yourself podcast i got mafia interviews i got all kinds of different playlists on there thank you again and of course we'll see you on the next one if you would like to support our podcast we got a few items that you can purchase all of these items can be found in the video description below the first one is sal's book the sinatra club you can get this personally autographed by sal the next one in our hottest seller is the 1972 sinatra club playing cards 
Back in Sal's Mafia days, he opened up his own social club named the Sinatra Club. Many mobsters would come to this club, even when there were all-out wars going on between different families. They would come to the Sinatra Club and play cards. Some of the mobsters that played with these cards were John Gotti, Dominic Cataldo, Tommy D. Simone, Foxy, Jimmy Burke, Willie Boyd Johnson, Tony Roach, Henry Hill, Joe Defiti, Danny Fatico, Gene Gotti, Peter Gotti, Joey Scopo, and many more. We're selling each one of these cards for $10 a piece. These cards are limited, we only got a thousand of them. The next item is an autographed picture of Sal from his Mafia days. Another item is the Dinner with the Mobster card. You can get this autographed as well. This was an event that Sal had hosted in the past. We also got the Ubots production ticket from an event that Sal had hosted. This is also autographed. The last item we got to offer is Sal's book, The Sins of the Father. Again, you can find all these items in the video description below.